Welcome to Coast to Coast. My name is Lily Weinberg, and I'm here joined by my colleague, Ellen Wong, Program Director from Philadelphia. Hi, Ellen. Hey, how's it going? It's going well, and I'm, I'm super excited because our colleague, Lillian Corral, which our audience members um, know very well, um, had her baby on Friday. I know, it's so exciting. I know. We miss you, Lillian. <laughs> I know, we, we do miss Lillian, but um, she is certainly busy um, doing uh, very important things um, with, her, with her newborn, um, but excited to share the screen with you, Ellen, and to go deeper into Philadelphia. And, and to see what, what's happening and all the cool things that are going on in Philadelphia. And so as our audience knows, um, Coast to Coast is really talking about the future of cities and, and what that means in context of COVID um, and, and how it's such a dynamic time. And we've had topics around public space, around technology, mobility. Um, and today I'm really excited to hear more and to learn more about what engagement looks like um, during a pandemic um, because that's complicated and there's different ways to engage of course safely um, during a pandemic. Um, so can you tell us a little bit more about about what we're talking about today? Yeah so um, I'm also really excited to be here so thanks for inviting me on today's show. Um, we have a powerhouse of women from Philly today and that gets me even more excited. Um, and we're going to be looking at the creative ways in which cities and particularly in Philadelphia, um, how we're engaging with our communities during this pandemic. You know, what are we seeing? What are we learning? What are the questions we're going to be grappling with? And, um, and so we're going to go deep into both the kind of our perspectives on what community engagement looks like, as well as some tactical things that hopefully our audience can take away with and perhaps implement um, in your own hometowns. And so with that, awesome. I'd like to um, welcome our guests, Sandy Clark, who is the Vice President of News and Civic Dialogue for WHYY, and hey, Maitre Roy, the Executive Director of Bartram's Garden. Hello. Hello. Hey guys, Hi. have fun, and I'll see you guys later. Yeah, that's <laughs> right. So we're going to spend about 15 minutes with me in dialogue, and, um, and then we'll invite Lily to come back in to post some questions from the audience. So for those who are tuning in today, please make sure to put your questions in the Q&A box or on Facebook. And if you're tuning in from Twitter, just make sure to include the hashtag night live. All right, let's get started. So um, just to begin, let's set the context for, for the conversation for today. And this question is for both of you, but we'll start with Sandy. Sandy, could you tell us a little bit about your work and what does community engagement mean to you and your organization? Hi, well, good afternoon, everyone, and I hope everyone is keeping well. Um, you know, so community engagement to me is really, is so foundational. Sometimes I get choked up talking about it, really. Uh, you know, this is about doing the work from inside out and not outside in. Uh, it's about, you know, asking and understanding and seeing and listening uh, to our communities uh, who, who aren't always asked and seen and heard and understood and um, you know and it's it it's a it's really about meeting for us as an organization meeting a real need instead of per, a perceived need right and it's recognizing the work um, that people in communities already are doing those in communities every day who are asking understanding seeing and and doing uh, and so and working together um, and it you know I think for uh, Journalism, uh, you know, it really is about, you know, it's about relevancy and connectivity. Uh, it's, it, you know, we hear the trust building all the time, but the reality is, is that, you know, we have to be there and people should know what to expect from us. Yeah, that's, that's great. Thanks so much for sharing that with us. And I, I do appreciate you also just mentioning kind of the emotional aspect mm -hmm. of your work. You know, we, we are in Philly together. It is our community and we're experiencing a pandemic together. Um, and so when you think about how are you connecting with folks, I do think there is um, just a lot of that emotional aspect that, that goes into what drives us um, in, in wanting to serve, serve each other. And so Maitre, would, do you mind answering the same questions? So tell us a little bit about your work and what does community engagement mean to you and Bartram's Garden? 
Well, thanks for having me. Uh, this is a great opportunity to share a little bit about Bartram's Garden, which is located in southwest Philadelphia along the tidal, lower tidal Schuylkill. The garden has over the years been seen much more as a private estate. So in the last few years, we've been working hard to make the garden uh, open, accessible, and to live up to its public space um, status, which it has had for years without necessarily uh, the, our neighbors knowing about it. And for us, the community engagement work over the last few years has been really focused on building relationships. The idea that uh, a garden, a park, a civic space uh, needs to mean something for its community. And how can Bartram be a space that becomes the family room, the classroom space for the Southwest community? So that's what we've been tackling at the garden in uh, through a number of different uh, sort of programmatic initiatives. and. Uh, at the heart of all of those programmatic initiatives is how can this garden really stand up and take responsibility and have its role be that of a public green space where everybody's welcome, where uh, our neighbors uh, who are largely an African-American community have not felt welcome in the past and have felt like they were venturing into a private estate. How, how can we in these uh, times when spaces such as the garden are uh, needed just for people's you know well-being and a little bit of stress relief how can this garden be that for the local community so in these times that relationship building and word of mouth in the southwest has been a really big part of what we've been focused on wonderful let's stay on that topic of relationship building as um, a core element to communication, which is just what I'm hearing from you, Maitre. And um, so since the pandemic's occurred, uh, you know, you both are thinking a lot about, you know, what that relationship building looks like, right? Um, you're th also thinking about representation and making sure folks are staying engaged, but you're both managing um, quite very different platforms from each other. So I think maybe we could look at it from those two different perspectives, one from the journalism side and thinking about the role of media and, and storytelling, and then Maitre, from your perspective around doing public spaces, um, how has your thinking around relationship building and community engagement changed during this time? You know, are there specific things that you've started to do that are different from what you were doing before? Are there things that um, perhaps you continue to be able to sustain because it just is the best way of connecting with community? Uh, please, I'd love to hear some examples or um, some things that you, you've tried to do or things that you've been able to continue to do through the pandemic. And I'll, well, you know, I'll leave it. Yeah. Uh, you know, um, Maitre and I come, you know, obviously from different sectors, but everything she said, you could have put W-H-Y-Y in there and, and it and is exactly the same, right? Uh, what do we mean as a, you know, a public media um, uh, station and organization? Uh, to our communities and, you know, how do we connect and um, how do we serve, serve needs. So it's just such a, uh, you know, I, I think this is a moment where, you know, the thought of, you know, what people are experiencing in their homes and their lives and um, it's really kind of sharper, sharpened our focus uh, in terms of service uh, in a way that it's not like, um, it's not program first, but it's people first, right? <laughs> And so when we think of ourselves in that kind of way, I think it, 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 you know, and I would also add, you know, it's also a time when organizations and boardrooms and newsrooms are being held accountable for, you know, diversity, inclusion, and if we ever get to the equity part, right, that's usually kind of, it, it sort of trails off before you even get there. So there's just a, so much, you know, just kind of, uh, uh, there's so many things that are kind of bringing to surface, I think, where we how we can best serve. And one of them uh, is that, you know, a lot of kind of our, our sort of legacy thinking and behaviors has been kind of, you know, it has sort of been knocked out of the way. Um, and, and in so many ways, they, you know, they can be barriers to um, engaging with communities and, and really meeting needs. So one example of this is that, you know, obviously there were lots and lots of protests uh, across the nation 
also in Philadelphia, um, you know, against pr police brutality and, um, and racial injustice. Uh, Pre-pandemic, we would not have been able to turn around a four-part series on police reimagine, right? We would not have been able to engage the community so quickly uh, and so, um, uh, you know, it, there was just an agility about being able to, to just say, you know what, here, let's talk about this topic, uh, particularly defund the police, right? And it was a narrative that was already being car carried in so many different ways. Uh, and so to be able to engage a community on TV, right, uh, on something that generally costs a lot of money, but in this world we're in now where we're used to the Zoom visuals, uh, and so we, we did it on TV, across digital, and then we had a community conversation after uh, the broadcast. That's just something that we would not have been able to do before. And I think it was a, a resonant conversation right in the moment, uh, as opposed to, you know, all this kind of, you know, production barriers that come up that normally would have probably kept us from doing it so quickly. Yeah, that's so, there's a few things that I, I want to point out that you said that really resonated with me is, people first versus program first. Mm -hmm. Sometimes when you're planning things, you're like, how do, you know, what can we do to, to get people to, you know, do, do something with us? And, you know, when you think about the people first, that's a much easier conversation and a much easier way to approach. And I think that's perhaps fundamental to community engagement is what I'm hearing from you. Um, I think the other thing that I'm hearing is um, the, the urgency that has shown up in the work that you're trying to do in community engagement. It's, it's been accelerated and catalyzed because of the pandemic and the, the social unrest that's going on as well. Um, and you've been able to utilize that momentum to be able to bring the news and information and images and engagement to folks. Um, and then the third thing was that, you know, because you're providing information to community and you're engaging with folks, is that you're actually in people's homes. And that's kind of, I had never really thought about that, that you're you're real, it's a very personal experience. So um, I just appreciate those things that you shared. Uh, Maitre, can I turn it to you? You know, how, how are you thinking about community engagement? How has it changed? Um, how has it stayed the same? Um, please share. Uh, one of the things at the garden that we've always taken for granted is this idea that this space allows people to gather. And all of a sudden, we weren't able to gather in the same way anymore. And so we had to pivot very quickly to figuring out how gatherings could happen without people actually being at the garden in, in groups. We also had to pivot to making sure that the casual visitor, which suddenly became a huge number during the pandemic, our numbers have just grown in uh, pretty st uh, in staggering ways. How do we ensure that the garden can be kept up so that it doesn't get uh, worn down with the extra use and so on? And how does the casual visitor become a uh, part of the garden's sort of way of being, given the, that uh, everybody's looking for that little respite and peace and quiet and a chance to be outdoors. So we very quickly pivoted to three priorities at the garden. One was that uh, we've always in the summer had about 50 student interns uh, engage in a deep way at the garden. Uh, these are students from our immediate community. We didn't want to have those jobs go away. This was ne not necessarily pocket money for a lot of the students. And so we were committed to making sure that the students would have a part virtual, part socially distanced program. And our youth leaders, I give them so much credit. They, on a basically overnight, reimagined uh, the engagement process, so much so that uh, students were taking home kits to figure out uh, the nutrition education component and doing it virtually from home over Zoom lessons. Uh, meeting in groups of three to six at the garden and socially distanced programming. So all of that had to happen within a matter of a, a few weeks. And that was, I think, one of the biggest things that we were able to do to keep our students um, engaged at the garden. The other big priority that we decided was going to be very important was to continue the work of uh, the farm, Sankofa Community Farm at the garden, uh, produces, provides about 15,000, 20,000 
uh, pounds of fresh locally grown produce to our neighbors. Uh, keeping that uh, farm up and running has been really a big focus for us, so much so that because we couldn't bring in volunteers as we usually do, we've had a rotation of staff um, come through to make sure that our production numbers don't decrease. Our way of communicating now that the produce is sort of uh, plentiful is actually through a very ultra local text group that we are using to tell people where the produce get, will be available and what times and so on. It only goes out to the neighborhood that we're focused in. It does not go out on Facebook. It does not go out on any other social media. We're using text groups to as many as 250, 300 families at once to communicate uh, events and activities at the garden. The third thing we pivoted to was just sort of well-being, mental sort of uh, recreational kinds of activities that would allow our neighbors to have a chance to, you know, keep their spirits up at a very difficult time. So uh, we are doing a lot of virtual programming that is about mental health, you know, uh, getting out on the trail, how to be on the trail safely. We pr provide um, hand sanitizers now across the entire length of the trail so that uh, families that are coming out can feel safe. Uh, we are also uh, providing a lot of sort of content that families can first engage with at home before they come out to the garden so that they can have a safe experience. Uh, we're doing a lot of this through uh, the word of mouth. We also have a street team uh, that goes out and flyers uh, specific program elements that we feel are, uh, we want to really engage locally with. One thing that the city did, which I really commend them on, is because our local pools and our rec centers were closed through the pandemic, they sort of uh, revamped a, a program called uh, Play Streets. So we were able to be one of the sites for play streets at Bartrams. Essentially, play streets means that children from the immediate community have a safe place to come and play um, and also have access to meals. So uh, during the summer when the school uh, you know, schools weren't necessarily providing meals as regularly. We felt that that was a role that the garden could play. So we sort of pivoted and uh, worked as a, a distribution site as well. So some of this has been uh, very much hands-on, very carefully uh, thought out, you know, within COVID guidelines programming. A lot of it has been virtual. And what's been amazing is to see the community response to like getting the texts and showing up at the farmer's market that just gets put up. Like there's almost like a, a call and response kind of thing that's been very interesting and uh, heartwarming in all of this. Yeah, that's wonderful. Thanks so much for sharing about the robust work that's happening at Bartram's Garden. And I think, um, you know, both what, what, you're, what you're both sharing is that there is really no silver bullet to how you can engage community. There's a lot of ways in which um, both your organizations are wanting to stay connected with folks um, in, in, in our city. And so, um, you know, I make sure you kind of brushed over it, but you know, that even just using a platform like text messaging mm -hmm. and pushing notifications, you know, I, it can be such a simple, simple little thing, but um, it's a very, um, very clear tool that you've been able to utilize, something that you already had in place and now it's become crucial to getting information out. Um, so I, I have a, my last question to you all is, um, you know, what opportunities do you see in the future of your communities post COVID? You know, what's, what are you doing now that's here that you think is here to stay? Uh, what are some things that you've discovered that, you know, this is incredible um, and, and we want to make sure it's something that we institutionalize in the work that we do in community engagement. Well, I think, uh, and I'm, this is one of the questions that was in the chat, you know, is about finding, you know, in engaging with new communities and also serving the longstanding communities that uh, we've had. Um, you know, this is a moment where, frankly, um, our membership, uh, which is, you know, 
largely white, though some of that is changing, but also um, older. And, and because I think of the, um, uh, the unrest, they, they, there actually is a yearning to have more information, right? And is a yearning to engage more, which, which is great because I think that that sometimes can be a, a barrier uh, to, 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 to new communities. We're, we're also um, working with community partners. You know, we, we have just created a, a news and information exchange, um, which is working with folks who are ready, are in communities, uh, who are creating content, who are you know uh, engaging with their communities, and um, uh, and it's really about breaking down, recognizing that there are people there who are doing this work every single day, uh, you know. And so we've we ask them, don't don't come to us and try to retrofit what you do um, uh, for WHYY. We want to meet you exactly where you are. Uh, we want to support what you do. And so we've, we've started with a number of partners and, and you know, we put their work on the radio, uh, talking about gun violence and exactly the voice that they capture it. And I think that that's gonna be, um, you, know, you know, very, very powerful in addition to helping us build relationships that are, you know, sustainable uh, in communities and not just swooping in and out. I do wanna add that there's, you know, other parts of WHYY. I mean, if you look across the whole organization, you know, everything's kind of kicked up in, into a different realm. Our, we expanded our education offerings um, on TV. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's, there's, you know, programming for, for kids all the way to and, to and up, right? Because we know that people are home with their kids, uh, you know, and there's a desire for a different kind of programming. Um, we've, you know, have been having race conversations, uh, you know, well before this moment, we'll continue to do so. And one thing that Zoom allows us to do is that, you know, we're planning a conversation now with some partners uh, where we're gonna have communities in different uh, breakout rooms and then bring us all together. So we can actually do a bunch of different neighborhoods in one engagement, uh, as opposed to, you know, trying to figure out physically where we all meet, right? And I think that's gonna be really interesting of kind of, you know, bringing together different parts of our city into one, uh, one conversation. And um, and I do and I want to give a nod to our media labs and uh, you know uh, career pathways program and these are you know you've been there Ellen so so you've seen what these these kids can do this could have been a time where you know it's just like we're not going to do the summer programs we're not going to uh, you know have students because we we haven't figured this out yet it, but instead we you know we created a, a careers to pathway um, paid you know summer program. And so uh, 22 students, you know, worked with various media partners. Uh, and, and, and we need to know kind of how they're processing information, how they're creating in the way that connects with their uh, audiences too in their communities. And so that was just so rich for us. I mean, I think just watching how they engage in conversations about being out of school, for example, right? And virtual learning, uh, you know, sometimes we forget that the youth voices, uh, you know, need to be heard. Uh, as well, and that they're creating content in their own way that is very, very connective. So I think across the whole organization, I mean, we found, uh, we have found ways to both address kind of some of the sort of uh, legacy mindsets, frankly, uh, and to break down the silos internally as well so that we can engage. And the other thing is that we've also engaged uh, several community uh, curators. Uh, and so these are uh, people that we are working with uh, in conversation with uh, who are creating conversations in their own communities and then we are listening and we are uh, engaging and, 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 and watching what their needs are as well. Yeah, that's fantastic. And Maitre, what about you? What's here to stay post-COVID? You know, one of the things I'm really uh, energized by is sort of the new urgency that we feel that uh, I'm hoping we can hold on to that. Uh, there are amazing conversations going on in Southwest Philadelphia about uh, climate change right now, about access and uh, sort of the lack of access and injustices and how do we tackle some of these issues. And I want to hold on to that. I want to hold on to the agility that I've seen amongst some of the leaders in the Southwest to jump into uh, solving problems and addressing need. I want to hold on to some of the kindness I see, some of the sort of generosity I see in an environment where it's easy to retreat to, you know, just being about yourself and 
being about, you know, just what uh, relates to your own personal life, uh, I see incredible generosity. I see incredible kindness. And I want to hold on to all of that. I want to really hold on to the urgency, though, to tackle big, challenging issues. I think this is the time it's come, it's here, and uh, it's going to redefine what public spaces are in communities. I think that's a beautiful note to um, loop Lily back in. And, um, and I know, Lily, you have some Q&A from the audience. We do. This is this is a fantastic conversation. Um, I want to elevate um, a couple of questions, um, and and then we'll 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 close the show. But but thanks, Ellen, for for leading this. Um, so so one one question is around. Um, uh, elevates the digital divide. And, and so as we think about engaging communities virtually, um, uh, how, how, are you, how are you dealing with um, our communities that don't have access to internet? And I know the, the, the texting is a great example of that. Um, and there are, Maitre, a bunch of questions about which platform you're using. But I'll, I'll start with you um, of, of how you're, you're thinking about um, engaging virtually um, uh, folks that, that don't have access to internet? So um, at Bartram's, our technology has not necessarily been what we've been, you know, leading with. Mm -hmm. so our texting service is an old fashioned service. It's like e-texting, it's really mm -hmm. simple. We, uh, over the last few years, as relationships have grown, we've asked people to sign on and we've asked them if they'd like to know more about when the farmer's market is up or when they when our movie nights are or things like that. We've combined it with our street team. We hire uh, locally, uh, sometimes as many as 10 people to uh, blast information across the neighborhood. It's all old fashioned, you know, sort of walk up and down the streets and let people know we go into, you know, s local stores and things like that. Um, so it's a combination of the two. And mm -hmm. uh, we've been, um, you know, uh, asking people to sign up to things so that uh, they can know when to show up and so on. And it's a bit of a long haul. It's taken us a few years to kind of build up the communication channels. But this isn't high tech that we're talking about um and we're a very low tech organization in fact uh, it's one of our has been one of our challenges uh, which is where i think the agility has come in uh, our yeah. staff have not been about technology they've been about hands-on engagement in the garden and so we've had to pivot really hard yeah the, yeah you know. sandy do you have any thoughts on 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 this question yeah, it's something, you know, I've been thinking a lot about too. Um, so, you know, we use GroundSource um, as a, you know, text through our uh, community contributors editor, and that's been very effective, actually. Um, and, you know, I think sometimes we forget that digital is also word of mouth. And so, you know, you can put the information out there. It still, you know, means something if you're, you're sharing it with your communities. And, and then we continue to work with our partners, and these are like faith leaders and others, right? Yeah. Who, who are very, very much connected um, in their communities in their various ways. Uh, but I think that's a really good question in terms of, you know, how do we, how do we get to people who, who um, you know, aren't going to get on a Zoom call? I will say that we've had so much more engagement. I feel a different, uh, maybe, crowd of people, you know, who are coming mm -hmm. to our conversations, um, you know, to get 200 people into a room at WHYY isn't that uncommon, but you know, that's a good event for us. Yeah. And in these conversations we're seeing two, 300 people. And so I think that there's something about just having kind of the, you know, we, we have, our time is different, right? And, and, and it's, you're not planning schedules in exactly the same kind of way. And so people can come on their own terms. And that is that is really an interesting point, you know, the the, the broader piece, the, the the potential of that um, of the outreach is is very exciting um, as we think about engagement. I'm I'm just gonna have one more question, um, and and Sandy, you 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 did answer this on the on the the Q and A, but I, I wanted to dig a little bit deeper about this this point that you made um, around the opportunity to um, be more nimble 
um, during this time. And, and I think that, that this, Maitre, you also um, kind of alluded to this too. Can you, can you tell us a bit more about why? Why do you think that, that you've been able to be more nimble during this time? Well, I think it's what Maitre said in terms of it's, it's, there's an urgency, right? And there's something mm -hmm. about, um, you know, all the layers between, you know, uh, uh, our communities and us. I mean, it's just, mm -hmm. it's, it sort of feels like that, you know, all the reasons that we can get into a room and have these exhausting meetings about, you know, why we can't do certain things because it doesn't fit here, doesn't fit there. We're not worried about that anymore. And, and I think there's something very liberating uh, and freeing uh, about that. Um, just being it not, you know, we don't have to have a lot of conversations about how we line up this shot and do all these kinds of things mm -hmm. that actually have, have been barriers. And so I think just understanding the need, you know, understanding um, our relevance and, and what we should mean to our communities and do mean to our communities in many ways. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Maitre, do you have any thoughts on that? I think it's what Sandy says. I feel like for us to be relevant, we had to pivot quickly. Mm -hmm. and. Um, it wasn't, I think, you know, done was better than perfect. So we just moved into doing some things. We failed at some things. We sort of pivoted quickly. I think getting um, the staff and my board and my staff are like, it's the, the talent pool is amazing. Getting everybody working together has been really uh, incredibly rewarding. And um, out of that engagement came really creative solutions for very simple things that we might have thought were barriers before. Mm -hmm. And um, I think, as Sandy says, you know, it just stripped away all of these layers and you sort of cut through the noise and got to the heart of it. And mm -hmm. um, I think when we said to ourselves that we were going to keep these three priorities for the garden, it meant some other stuff had to take a back burner. And that was okay. We made that decision collectively and we decided that this was going to be our focus. And um, I think that keeping everybody on the same page has been another really important aspect um, of this the, during this time. We have a ton of conversations, maybe even more than before, about what's happening, what, how things are impacting everybody. So I think just keeping those lines of communication open all the time mm. is big. Fantastic. Well, well, thank you. We are we are at time, um, but um, I, um, you know, it is it, it is an incredibly challenging time, um, you know, uh, in, in our world um, right now. And but but you two have have left me feeling very optimistic in, in many ways. Um, and and Ellen, thank you for for leading this very important conversation. And Sandy and Maitre, um, you are fabulous and um, and so insightful. Um, and and when I think about you know the simple things as as people first, people first. It it, it you know really simplifying it. Um, it. It matters and and it's what matters in in our communities. Ellen, do you want to uh, uh, say any final words? No, just that you know how much I love you both, and um, and we're you know we're just so thankful as a community to be able to have leaders like you um, really thinking very deeply about these things and also taking. Um, taking that chance at trying things out, uh, whether they, they, you know, fully work out, you know, in the way in which we, we think about them or we dream them up and sometimes they, they we do fail. And I think, um, and I think we need to take those chances, especially during these unprecedented times. So thank you so much for That's your time right. and like, thanks for having me. Of course, thanks. And, um, and, and for folks um, who are still hanging on, we did put a bunch of resources in the chat box um, that, that you can look at. Um, and we also will be linking to our website, the resources for, for both panelists. Um, and next week, we'll do a deep dive um, with Meg Daly, uh, the executive director of The Underline, and really look at what does resiliency and innovation look like um, during these unprecedented times. So with that, uh, thank you. And see you all next week, Tuesday at 1 p.m. Eastern. Take care. Bye. Bye. Bye.